Our next speaker is a research psychologist and an expert on psychoactive drugs and the psychology of addiction and risk behavior. His research interests include behavioral economic research on decision-making, addiction, and sexual risk behavior. He has published over 90 scientific articles and chapters, with 30 of them focused primarily on psychedelics. In 2005, he initiated the psilocybin cancer protocol at Johns Hopkins University with Dr. Roland Griffiths, and has been working on psilocybin as a medication for tobacco smoking cessation since 2007. As associate professor of psychiatry at Johns Hopkins University, he is at the very forefront of psychedelic research. Please give a hand for Dr. Matthew Johnson. Hi, everybody. Um, well, first, I'd like to thank Philip for the gracious introduction. Um, and for he and Michelle, the other organizers, for really showing um, wonderful hospitality and setting up a really kick-ass meeting. I mean, I know we're just a little bit into it, but so far this is great because bucking the trend for psychedelic meetings, things have been like on time um, perfectly. And, and what a wonderful kickoff with Alicia's talk, so thank you to her. Um, that was a really large dose of wisdom that she administered. Um, I should say a very large dose of wisdom. And the, uh, the stats nerds like me in the audience really presented that. As soon as she said that, I was thinking, Cohen's D of .08. That's Cohen 88, man. That's, that's convention. You're well justified. So, um, But she hit such very important themes in that talk, so... It was very much appreciated. We're going to need to stick to those guide rails as this field grows. So um, my next set of thanks goes to a very large team at Johns Hopkins. I've been part of this group um, with Roland and others since 2004. Um, I've undoubtedly forgotten some people in this very large um, thank you list, and my apologies for that, but um, just to call out a, a few of the key folks, obviously Roland Griffiths, Mary Casamano, Al Garcia, um, Fred Barrett, um, Bill Richards, and then on the, the funding side, um, uh, very thankful for critical funding provided by a number of wonderful organizations, Hepta Research Institute, the Beckley Foundation, Council on Spiritual Practices. And this is a pretty recent photo of our team, of our growing uh, team. We now have several faculty members besides Roland and myself, um, Fred Barrett and Al Garcia are in that photo there in the back row. So most of the research I'm going to tell you about that's gone on at, at Hopkins is focused on psilocybin. So this, this is uh, the classic psychedelic that's present in well over 100 different species of mushrooms, many of them in the psilocybe uh, genus. What you're seeing here is a... Let's see if I can get that spot. Oh, wrong button. There we go. Aha. You some real-time learning going on here. Okay, there we go, right? You see that? No? All right, I'm going to forget that. Um, right there, classic PowerPoint. Um, a beautiful specimen of Psilocybe cubensis uh, mushrooms. This photo is from Paul Stamets, one of the uh, world's experts on uh, psilocybin and other mushrooms. But by, psilocybin is a classic psychedelic, and that means, uh, like other classic psychedelics, it has primary activity mediated by the serotonin 2A system, either as an agonist or partial agonist, and has uh, very similar effects to other classic psychedelics, including LSD, mescaline, and dimethyltryptamine. Psilocybin and other classic psychedelics have an absolutely ancient history going beyond recorded history um, shown in some of these uh, uh, carving, uh, stone carvings and also cave paintings dating back 
um, at least around 10,000 years ago. And in the modern era, depending on how you define modern era, psychedelics were intensely investigated as research tools and therapeutics from the 1940s through the 1970s. And a lot of things were looked at, but the most promising therapeutic lines of research were for cancer-related distress and for alcoholism. So we'll touch on both cancer-related distress and another form of addiction in some of the work I'll show you. And then the dark ages happened. That despite promising preliminary findings, human research with psychedelics became largely dormant. And it's important to understand that this was largely a reaction to the, uh, to the public association of LSD with the 60s counterculture. And while there was some squirrely research, there was a whole lot of responsible research going on. Researchers like Sidney Cohen, Humphrey Osmond, who were well aware of the risks of psychedelics, the harms that they could cause in the wrong setting. And these folks sort of begged some of the wilder research types to tone it down. Um, but it was really that larger association with the rapidly changing culture um, that really caused the medical and scientific use of psychedelics in human research to be sacrificed. And there are risks, um, kind of like what uh, Alicia said, some of the things may not be very uh, popular to, to all, but um, this might fall in that category. But there are risks to psilocybin and other psychedelics. Recently, uh, our group published this review paper on the abuse liability and risks of psilocybin. And one of our suggestions in the paper is that if the United States FDA approves psilocybin as a medicine for an indication, that if that would prompt a rescheduling, that it would really belong in something more like Schedule 4 with the appropriate additional safeguards about how it should be used rather than certainly anything close to Schedule 1, given that it's... Uh, uh, it certainly doesn't have high potential for abuse, um, which is the definition of Schedule 1. But briefly, what the risks are, um, uh, psilocybin and other classic psychedelics can harm, cause harm in people with psychosis or predisposition for psychosis or other psychotic um, disorders. And there are very reliable ways with psychiatric screening to identify those folks. For any human being who takes a large enough dose of a psychedelic, it can cause fear, panic, confusion, which can lead to um, potentially dangerous behavior. So this is the so-called bad trip. We'll say a little more about this. Uh, and even though it was overplayed in the propaganda against LSD in the 19, late 60s, nonetheless, there are um, occasionally uh, accidents um, harmful effects that can occur when people uh, react um, uh, in one of these bad trip uh, situations. At the physiological level, um, psilocybin and other psychedelics can cause moderate elevations in pulse and blood pressure. Most people who have controlled hypertension can still participate in, in this clinical administration, but people at more severe um, uh, levels of cardiac risk, um, it's not for them. And then we've shown that psilocybin causes headaches um, within about a day following the administration of psilocybin. In the mild to moderate severe category, it's dose dependent. It's nothing uh, that would appear to keep anyone from participating in this research or eventual clinical use, but nonetheless it falls in, in this uh, range of, of, of risk. And then finally, uh, despite these other risks, unlike your typical drugs of abuse, there is no addiction. That is to say, no compulsive drug seeking. So folks um, 
that are familiar with the scientific literature on this, this falls squarely into the duh category. We know no one's jonesing to get their next psilocybin or LSD fix. Um, although these drugs can be abused, meaning used in a way, like any powerful tool, in a way that can harm oneself or others, they're just, we know squarely from the neuroscience, from the epidemiology, from very reliable non-human operant models, all of these levels of analysis, we know that they're not drugs of addiction. In that paper, we reviewed a large number of expert reviews, user reviews, government surveys, uh, how psilocybin compares to other drugs, both le illegal and legal. And as you can, I'll show you just a few of these. As you can see, um, this is an evaluation by a variety of United Kingdom experts. Um, typically, psilocybin or mu magic mushrooms uh, fall at the very lowest or very close to the lowest level in terms of both harm to the user and harm to uh, others and society. So, um, Dutch experts here, experts across the EU here. Part of that norming that Alicia mentioned, um, this was a comp contribution of ours in that area. In 2008, we published the safety guidelines, basically saying if you're going to conduct research in humans with high-dose classic psychedelics, you should really follow something like this, these guidelines. And, and uh, it's unfolded the way we had intended. We know that the publication has assisted in the approval of studies at a growing number of universities. We know that IRBs or institutional review boards or ethic, ethics boards has, have used this review um, to evaluate um, proposed research. And briefly, very briefly, um, one minimizes the risks I mentioned um, that can come with psilocybin or other psychedelics by careful screening for psychiatric disorders, um, by preparation of the volunteer, by careful monitoring of the volunteer by more than one uh, individuals who develop a close therapeutic relationship with that individual, and then integration or follow-up discussion with the individual, which includes a probing for potential um, lasting adverse effects. And all of that because you can kind of get this, uh, this is kind of like the challenging experience here that our little friends are having. <laughs> so we try to minimize that. So more about the challenging experiences of SpongeBob having his own difficult psychedelic experience. We have published the first um, validated questionnaire for assessing bad trips or challenging experiences. And to be clear, we did not intend challenging experience to be a euphemism to downplay um, that these can be dangerous in the wrong environment. Um, this is a broader description in a safe uh, environment in clinical research, um, although we count these as adverse events. Um, they, in fact, can also be some of the most powerful learning experiences, and both in the laboratory and in some survey research we've done in thousands of folks that have used psychedelics on their own, even these challenging experiences can be some of the most meaningful experiences in people's lives. To be clear, we do our best to minimize those challenging I experiences, but nonetheless, they occur in, a, occur in about a third of the folks that will get a high dose of a psychedelic like psilocybin. And the basic factors the, that, the, that our research have identified that kind of uh, lumped together as different types or varieties of challenging experiences are grief, fear, death, insanity, isolation, physical distress, and paranoia. Sounds like a party. These are the fun guys. Um, 
one of the ways you minimize those uh, challenging experiences is by having a very pleasing physical environment, but even more importantly, a interpersonal environment. So um, within appropriate boundaries, uh, hand-holding is one of the most powerful tools, and you prepare for this um, with the participant before they're administered the, the the psychedelic, but that can be one of the most powerful tools in grounding someone and helping them through a very challenging experience and then obviously an aesthetically pleasing environment. That's Mary Cosimano uh, as lead guide in our mock session right there. Our very first laboratory research uh, at Johns Hopkins using psilocybin uh, looked at healthy normals or people without nominal problems to be fixed. Of course, we all have our problems, whether they're diagnosable or not. Um, but we demonstrated that it was safe within this structured setting with those safeguards I mentioned. And uh, remarkably, this experience, even amongst spiritual seekers, was rated as amongst the five most meaningful life experiences by the majority of participants. This is laying on a couch in a hospital in Baltimore. <laughs> the most unlikely place um, to have the most meaningful experience in your life, one might conclude. And we saw improvements in mood and quality of life for over a year after sessions, not just as rated by the individual receiving psilocybin, but by uh, community monitors, their spouses, their, their significant others, their co-workers, their friends. Another aspect of those positive experiences were mystical experiences, and we're not using mystical in some loosey-goosey term. This refers to a particular psychological experience that goes back to, in terms of the study of it, William James, the founder of American psychology over 100 years ago, and this refers to experiences that have been characterized outside of psychedelic use across different parts of the world, throughout uh, the centuries, expressed in different languages, uh, involving dimensions such as unity, positive mood, a sense of transcending time and space, and ineffability. In other words, the person uh, says, no matter what I say, I, I, I'm falling short. I can't fully describe that experience. And I like to say, even though we kind of, we like to say as researchers that these experiences are in, ineffable, we, treat, we keep trying to F it up by asking people to describe those experiences. <laughs> so, uh, but we, we have people come as far as they can in those descriptions. So we encourage people to, and, and so this particular scale, the MEQ30, is the first measure validate it to look at acute experiences. In other words, the administration of a psychedelic or something that happens on a particular day. Um, mystical experience had been, it had been evaluated in other ways, uh, typically the accumulation of experiences over the lifetime previously. Something interesting to throw in, this is a, one of the many plants in my office in Baltimore. Um, my colleague Derek May gifted this to me. It's, it's a vine uh, growing out of, the, out of the soil and then going back into the soil and out again, um, symbolizing really the bridge of clinical research firmly rooted in basic mechanistic science. So I like to think about that. Our second uh, laboratory study was a follow-up in healthy normals, looking at the dose effects, in other words, placebo plus a variety of specific doses of psilocybin, and we found increasing psilocybin dose has an orderly effect on mystical experience, challenging experience, and long-term positive attribution. We also found in pooling across our first study and our second study, um, so we got a larger sample of participants, uh, an increase in the personality dimension of openness. And openness refers to an appreciation of aesthetics, um, uh, the willingness to hold 
and listen to multiple points of view, um, points of views of others that you don't necessarily agree with, and also to, to hold them as not an either or type situation, to hold them in mind at the same time. So interestingly, by definition, personality is something that's not supposed to change. It's supposed to be stable by definition, and typically only age or major life events that you can't throw into an experiment like marriage, um, things like this uh, affect personality. So it's still, to our um, knowledge, this was the very first experimental study with a discrete event, administering a drug, for example, to have changed a personality dimension, speaking to the magnitude of the uh, intervention that we're dealing with. And interestingly, it's not just getting a drug. It's not... Um, study after study has shown it's not just the strength of the acute drug effect, it is the mystical nature of the experience that those domains of unity and transcending time and space, etc., that I referred to before, those psychological aspects of the experience are what predicts um, long-term improvements in healthy normals, and as I'll show you, um, having successfully quit smoking or having less depression and anxiety within cancer patients. I mentioned the, the headache research. We found that psilocybin uh, causes uh, mild to moderate, moderate headaches. Uh, and we don't have the answer yet, but this might be a clue. These dose-related effects might be a clue to understanding how psilocybin can treat cluster headaches. So hopefully folks can pick up on that thread. With my colleague Peter Hendricks at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, um, he invited me to, to help with this study, um, a, an epidemiological study that looked at um, over uh, or about 25,000 uh, parolees, people who were criminal offenders. And this is sort of following up in the spirit of Leary's Concord prison experiment, um, asking the question, can experience with psychedelics help criminal offenders not um, uh, commit crimes again? And after controlling for other variables, including drug use, it was clear that psychedelic use in the lifetime was associated um, with being less likely to violate parole um, with drug and other uh, crimes. And uh, interestingly, the thing that really kind of seals the deal for me was that every other drug either most were significantly so, or at least showed a trend towards an increased likelihood of criminal uh, reoffense. And psychedelics were like, you know, the thing that didn't belong. They were bucking the trend and showing that decreased likelihood. If you ask the general public about the association between psychedelics and suicidal tendencies, most people would probably say that psychedelics increase suicidality. But another line of research, again, epidemiological research with Peter, suggests uh, otherwise psychedelic users were less likely to contemplate and attempt suicide. Um, and this was in fo a follow-up um, analysis true for psilocybin specifically, and this was based on uh, the largest government survey in the U.S. on drug use and health, uh, and over, or about 200,000 individuals. So I'll just say it's one of my favorite bands, Suicidal Tendencies. Not all of the psychedelic folks are super into jam bands. There's more variety than that. And like the criminality study, uh, other drugs of abuse were associated with an increased risk of suicidality, again suggesting there's something special here. I'll describe briefly our, our uh, cancer uh, study. These were individuals with life-threatening cancer. They had a depressive disorder or an, and or an anxiety disorder, about a third with depression, third anxiety, a third with both, um, attributable to their uh, serious cancer diagnosis. They had two psilocybin sessions that were five weeks apart. There's some nuances I'm glossing over here, but largely the doses were, in one session they got a trivial dose meant to not really have an effect. One uh, milligram per 70 kilogram, uh, and 22, a moderately high dose, 22 milligrams per 70 kilogram. Um, 
the per 70 kilograms is just about, we, we dose proportional to their body weight. And what you're seeing here on our gold standard depression scale to the left and on our anxiety scale uh, to the right, we're seeing at baseline people were at clinically severe levels of distress. After the first session, the high dose group had received the real psilocybin dose. We see a dramatic decrease um, into um, substantially improved uh, level that wouldn't be diagnosable anymore as a disorder. Uh, we see a pretty big fall with the uh, trivial dose group, and that probably speaks to both the placebo expectancy effects and the really high level of rapport building and discussion we have with individuals. But nonetheless, after the crossover, um, it's just that one group gets the high dose first, then the low dose, and the other group vice versa. So at the post two time point, you have everybody, because they've now all had a high dose psilocybin session, you see all, all of the groups um, have this drastically lowered level of distress. And the real crazy thing that really suggests this is a different paradigm in psychiatry is that, I mean, this is just five months later, the post one and post two, but then we see the same levels of reduction essentially six months later. This is essentially from a, you know, a single high dose experience. That's just crazy. We don't see that. I mean, the most ketamine is rightfully, you know, kind of being looked at as a breakthrough in psychiatric medicine for having an average of effect that antidepressant effects that that last that's immediate and last one week, maybe three weeks. Um, we're seeing effects for six months, and to be clear, it's not that symptoms increased after six months, that's just as long as out as we've looked. So we could be really talking about indefinite improvements here. Um, certainly they lasted for some of these folks' um, lifetime, because individuals did pass away, a number of them. And as I mentioned, we saw uh, a, a significant correlation between the, how strong the mystical nature of the experience was with how much their depression or anxiety was reduced, suggesting it's the experience, not just getting a dose of psilocybin. This is our smoking uh, cessation work I'll describe. Um, we started out with an open label study. There was earlier research with alcoholism, one, and then one study with heroin addiction from the 1960s suggesting this kind of cross-drug, uh, a general addiction treatment effect with LSD. We gave it a stab with psilocybin and said, okay, what about something like cigarette smoking? These were 15 treatment-resistant smokers. We used cognitive behavioral therapy as the therapeutic backdrop in the preparation sessions and in the follow-up integration sessions. And there were two to three sessions of psilocybin with uh, doses uh, about an average of 20 to 30 milligrams. And we had kind of an upward progression. We started at 20, and then if the effect wasn't too strong for them at their judgment, we moved up to 30, and most people followed that pattern. Now, the study got a lot of uh, publicity, and we appreciate the attention. And to be clear, we never encourage you know, folks to use this at home. Nonetheless, on top of that general cautionary statement, holy cow, that's a lot of mushrooms. <laughs> really don't try this. Um, I'm not even sure what types of mushrooms. Those are probably uh, not even psychoactive mushrooms. But that's a, if that was Cubensis, that would be a whole lot of mushrooms. Um, one reason to look at smoking, aside being an interesting form of addiction that's kind of, doesn't have some of the drastic life consequences, it's kind of a, you know, in terms of your spouse leaving you, you're, you've ruined your life, it's more of this pure self-control issue where the consequences are, negative consequences are, you know, very delayed. Um, on top of that, it's also kind of an issue itself. It's, um, compared to other drugs, it's the mortality absolutely dwarfs everything else. About a half million people in the year uh, in the U.S. Uh, in, die every year from smoking. Um, and then that's about five million worldwide. That's the estimate. Or I could just sum it up. Everyone knows this part. I don't have to spend too much time on it. Smoking is bad, Mukai, to quote uh, Mr. Mackey from South Park.
one of our public health experts in the United States. Uh, here are the results. The, the dashed up uh, uh, vertical line is when they got their first do the dose of psilocybin, which was their target quit date, when they planned on quitting. So to the left of that was before psilocybin, to the right was after psilocybin. And I'm showing you here breath carbon monoxide. That's a reliable indicator biologically of whether you've been smoking. And that dashed line going across is kind of a threshold between whether you've probably been smoking versus not. This is before psilocybin. This is after psilocybin. Um, these are the type of data that they teach you in grad school. You really don't need statistics to know you're on to something here. Um, there's an effect. This is really an unfair comparison. These, these numbers come from different studies with different techniques. But just to show you how encouraging this open label um, study was, the success rate, and uh, at, this is showing you at six months, was so much higher than you typically see. I mean, the best medication we have is Varenicline or Chantix, which has a success rate that can vary from like around 25 to 35 percent. Um, so, uh, with 80 percent biologically verified at six months, we were um, really encouraged. The question was essentially, it was just an open label, but the question was, is this promising enough to be worthy of follow-up? And if that's the question, the answer was absolutely. And so we're doing that follow-up now. I'll tell you more about it. Um, this is a piece of art that was created by our very first participant in the pilot study. This is an old pack of cigarettes and matches encased in acrylic. Um, yeah, it's one of the fa my favorite objects that I keep in, and I'll always keep in my office. We followed up that original study. Um, things look so good, we went to the IRB and asked them to, to, to look even further uh, along at people and found that success rates at 12 months, again, all biologically confirmed, was about 67%. And then at an average of two and a half years, um, 60%. So again, just crazy high rates that really encouraged us. And like the other research I showed you, um, success tended to be correlated with the degree of mystical experience. So um, in showing these data, I was so often approached by people after a talk, it's like, hey, this happened to me, you know, either like last year or sometimes like 20 years ago or something like that. So we put out a survey, and I also found lots of Arrowhead and blue light trip reports making this claim. We put out a survey, we found over a thousand people that said, yeah, this happened to me, I quit or reduced smoking out of a psychedelic session. You know, not, not necessarily, usually, typically without therapeutic intent. And the coolest data that came out of this for me was, we asked people, rate you know, this laundry list of withdrawal symptoms compared to other times when you've tried to quit smoking, if you've tried to quit smoking. And the modal or, or most typical response that we found was for, the, for most symptoms, like the bodily symptoms, it was, yeah, it's pretty typical, about the same. But when you get to the affective, the emotional symptoms, anxiety, restlessness, depression, irritability, craving, those were the ones where the modal response was not just less severe, but much less severe, the extreme category. So this, to me, suggests a bridge between you know, the effects we're seeing in the cancer patients and in other research with straight-up depression and what we're seeing in the addictions. There's probably a common core. Um, even though we didn't ask for it, one of the participants found our contact and sent us a selfie. They happened to have a photo of them smoking their last cigarettes after they, uh, when they were actually dosed on a high dose of mushrooms, and even though we do take confidentiality very seriously, this cat said, I'm not afraid of revealing myself, please, I want my story to be told. So, a quarter ounce of mushrooms, we don't encourage it, but I mean, you can see here, you know, with the eyes, there's something going on. Um, said it was the last one ever, they keep following up with us. Uh, we've done some qualitative analysis and follow-up work with those pilot participants. The themes that emerged out of people's open-ended descriptions were pers a persisting sense of interconnectedness, all curiosity, reduced withdrawal symptoms, 
uh, perceived as not addictive. Again, duh, if you know the literature. Um, other positive changes, altruism, appreciation for aesthetics. People kept saying, you know what, this is about a lot more than quitting smoking. Um, and then insights, profound insights into self-identity and sm reasons for smoking. Often people said smoking kind of became it kind of latched on to this more fundamental human desire. Our first participant called it the incessant need. Um, and it makes me think, I'll go through it quickly here, a quote from Herman Melville. This is Ahab and referring to Moby Dick. All visible objects, man, are but, a pa are but as pasteboard masks, but in each event there some unknown but still reasoning thing put forth from the moldings of its features from behind the unreasoning mask. If man will strike, strike through the mask, how can the prisoner reach outside except thrusting through the wall? To me, the white whale is that wall shoved near me. That inscrutable thing is chiefly what I hate. So this sort of incessant need to me is very much what I think of instead of the white whale with this quote. In the current randomized trial, um, I'll go quickly here. We have 80 folks. We're randomizing. It's comparative efficacy trial. There's not blinding, but we're randomizing folks in an open-label fashion to either psilocybin or nicotine patch with the same cognitive behavior therapy. We're doing fMRI before and after. So far, we're really encouraged. We're at about, um, for the folks that have gotten out to year, about 55% versus 30% success rate. So um, hopefully those promising trends hold up. The, the next day cognitive effects and the associated neuroscience are telling a suggestive story. People seem to have less cognitive interference with a Stroop-like task. I don't have time to say much about that. In the people who have successfully quit with psilocybin compared to those um, in the nicotine uh, patch group, and we see a, an associated um, ch uh, reduction in parietal cortex activation that's associated with that cognitive interference. We're thinking that cognitive interference is kind of maybe map, it's the ability to kind of resist a prepotent impulse to kind of hold yourself back, um, a, a response disinhibition. Uh, so this may be like this mindful re approach that a lot of people are saying after they quit. It's like, yeah, the cravings come, but I know that I've quit, and like, yeah, the craving's gonna come and pass, and I'm cool with that. I see it coming a mile away. A crushed up pack of cigarettes after our quit smoking ceremony. Very quickly, I'll say we've published our biggest study with 75 meditators who, either, who are starting a meditation practice to see, hey, does getting out of a psychedelic session help with that? Um, either they got a trivial dose, um, a couple of high doses, or those same high doses plus extra support, including group discussion meetings, um, which isn't typically done. Quickly, the mystical experience from the session was all about whether you got the high dose or a trivial dose. But the fruits down the road from the experience very much, we saw an additive effect with the meditation, with the enhanced support. So in terms of altruism, personal well-being ratings, positive behavior change, so why is it helping with all these disorders? Um, I think co a common mechanism, it, you can really think about addiction broadly defined, whether it's a substance or whether you're talking about um, addiction to a certain way of thinking. I'm a loser, I'm never gonna make it, um, that you see in uh, major depression. So this may be associated with overly rigid and suboptimal brain network dynamics. Um, Dave and Chuck Nichols and I uh, wrote about this in a recent review paper. Uh, Dave put forth an interesting theory on neuronal avalanches. I encourage you to, to look at that if you're into the neuroscience. But this idea that there may be something like an imprinting or this acute plastic state that's been demonstrated with network activity, but then in terms of long-term persisting effects, there may be kind of a resetting once the system gels um, and may back, go back to a more optimal state, which reminds me of this quote from Emerson, do not go where the path may lead, go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. I think that's what psychedelics are doing behaviorally and perhaps in terms of brain activity. Um, I'll skip past, we've done other work with MDMA, harm reduction, um, uh, 
pill testing works to reduce consumption of dangerous substances. We've done cool stuff with salvinorin A, which is a substance in salvia divinorum. It's very powerful. Um, done stuff with dextromethorphan, very psychedelic. You might know that from cough syrup. Um, some differences, but we've got a number of plans for continuing looking at depression outside of cancer. So we're doing some surveys on addiction. Um, we're working with long-term meditators now. Um, we're doing a study with religious professionals, and we're hoping to do more work with cancer eventually in, for a, a phase three type work. And opioid dependence is something we're very interested. And that's really the end. Thank you very much. Thank you. Did it eat up all the time? We'll, yeah, we'll, okay. we'll go for the break. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much, Matthew.